The first instrument that I played um, was percussion, was the drum. And um, I started that before I could speak. So literally, I would say banging the instrument initially, but I was playing the drums all the way from uh, whatever, one or whatever, all the way up to five, six years old. Um, so that was my first instrument. My father had a poetry percussion group and I joined that and sat in on some of that. So that gave me my rhythmical understanding, which is kind of important before I pick up my later instruments. And I was performing, I did a radio show when I was five years old, performing percussion um, for um, a show by Alex Pascal, who, was a, who worked for Black London as one of the first programs, one of the first black programs on radio, actually. He was one of the first DJs. And then when I was seven, eight, is when I first heard the chora and the cello. I, I knew the chora from a chora player that was staying with us from Senegal, where actually he was visiting from Paris. It was a musician called Bully Sissoko, Senegalese musician. He's the first person I saw play the chora and just the sound, and he was an amazing singer. And he also was playing with another artist called Sarah Carrera. And the two of them, they had a duo that sound just impacted me and I knew I wanted to learn that instrument. So that was the chora. And then for the cello, it was the same because it, I first heard the cello when I was at primary school. Someone was playing, they demonstrated the piano, they demonstrated the violin, and they demonstrated the cello last. And again, the sound of the cello, I was like, yeah, I can do that. I don't know why I thought I could do that because I never played it, but uh, just the sound grabbed me. And I said, oh, I want to learn that, that instrument. So the two instruments grabbed me because of their sound, not necessarily because of their cultural affinity. Uh, that just came later. And then with the chora, Following that journey of wanting to learn that instrument, that eventually took me to meeting my teacher, Amadou Bantang Jabati, who's a master griot and chora player from the Gambia. And at the age of 10, I went to Gambia to study with him at his home, with his family, staying with his family for over a month. Um, and then, you know, was doing the kind of apprenticeship thing with, Amadou Bansang as part of the griot tradition, which is an apprentice, master apprentice relationship and also studying with his son, Sanjo Ali Jabati. It's a hereditary tradition, so it's all within, within the families. Then at the same time with the cello, at the age of nine, I'd st I started the cello, I, st I had a private teacher who I was studying with and um, doing those lessons, I then applied to the Purcell School of Music at the age of nine, then started there. And so, these two parallel traditions I was being, was studying in, um, learning very, very different methodologies, but learning these two traditions in parallel. Different. Um, they were different because one was an oral tradition, yeah. 
one was a written tradition. So with the Kora, it was very much about learning by ear. I remember the first lesson I had with, um, with Amadou, he was actually visiting here in London. I thought I, well, I'd started, or I thought I'd started playing the Kora a little bit. <coughs> I mean, I, I, I preface this with he was known as the master of the Kora. <laughs> That's an important part of this story. And he truly was for solo Kora. No one has surpassed him for solo Kora. So I'm sitting here with my Kora. He's sitting there with his. And um, then he starts to play because he didn't speak much English and I didn't speak Mandinka. He starts to play the theme maybe once or twice as they do. And then before you know it, he's flown off to, to the stratosphere <laughs> and meanwhile I'm here kind of going bong yeah, yeah. watching these fingers move like lightning and just go yeah I think bong, <laughs> bong, bong literally trying to find your way because it wasn't a thing of it was like he goes and you have to pick up so your speed is going to be how quick you can pick it up and it was a very different way in a way from say the western classical thing where you know this is the first piece you're learning it da, 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 and you're kind of i wouldn't say spoon fed but you're definitely directed in a certain way whereas the other one you at the beginning it's like whoa uh, survival of the fittest you you jump in or you fall down <laughs> so it was very interesting that side of it that's actually why i studied a lot of the themes with his son because amadou was a bit too over there at the beginning. So then I studied a lot of the themes with his son who was closer to me when I was in Gambia. And um, then when we'd learned the themes, I would then practice those all day. Then in the evening, Amadou would come and play on top. And then of course he could do all his weavings in and out and we had the ground grounding. But I said it was learning and then you're listening to what he's doing whilst you're doing those themes over and over the refrain. You're listening to how he's extemporizing around those themes. And though you don't learn that directly, it's sinking in. So later you start to do those things, but you're not taught how to do those things. You pick that up by ear. The cello, as I said, in a way it was easier to go further, quicker, because you've got the, once you've got the music, you can then start playing. So as quick as you can go, you can progress quicker at that point. Um, so it was freer in a way, funnily enough, doing the cello earlier on and quite restrictive with the chorus because you're having to learn the themes over and over and over and over the same things over and over again till they're till you know them backwards, basically. But then later the freedom comes with the core once you're extemporizing and you know those themes. Um, and then with the cello and that tradition of the written tradition, the funny thing is later you can then be restricted by the fact you now can't improvise. By the time you've gone much further down the road, you're very, very focused on the written note as opposed to so it was interesting, the, two, the parallel of the two traditions. So how, how did the, the core experiences then feed into the cello experiences? Like if you learn anything from the core in your cello playing, like how does that, does, does that manifest? They didn't cross over at all. And I think, yeah, they were just very separate. I had a schizophrenic kind of existence because you like do this or you do this the only thing that i think where i did notice connections well i didn't notice them but i picked them up innately and then later it became more apparent my affinity with things like baroque music my affinity with things like the bach suites the cello bach suites because i recognized similar similar kind of concepts and ideas as to what I was exploring in chora music, the polyphony, the refrains, the kind of extemporization of themes and all of that. 
I could see the parallel, whereas with repertoire later from classical into the romantic, really was very, very different musically. So the core is more like the piano, more like a soundscape, which is different from the cello. So for, my, for me, that's how I see the two instruments uh, as being different. Earlier on, I found the core was easy for me to improvise and extemporize because I'd been brought up in, in that. And then for the cello, I could read music. For the core, I couldn't. So even, if, even though I read music, if you put, even today, if you put music in front of me that's scored, the process, because I'm not used to it, I basically can't, I can read it, but it'll take me so long, it's quicker that I just do, the, do it by ear listen to the melody and I put it onto the instrument. So still now, the chorus is still an oral, oral traditional instrument for me, even though I read music. But really it was only in, t in my teens when I started to get into jazz and other forms of music and looking at the cello differently as I was playing cello as bass in a jazz trio at school, that was at Purcell School. And that, then improvising on the cello and that, beginnings of that, I then started to make connections with the chorus through that. So in a way, that's why that was more the diasporic experience musically brought the bridge between those two, those two worlds. The coming together of my instruments, traditions, all of that only happened as my realizing myself as a composer. It was as a composer that I was able to bring my instruments, my traditions together. Before that, nothing else was able to unite those things because there was no repertoire for chora and cello. There was no repertoire, yeah, there was no repertoire for any of it. You know, like, like Griot, Casamadi singing with symphony orchestra or jazz trio, all the crazy ideas that I have or have had for compositions that I heard in my head. There was no repertoire before I'd done those things for those combinations. Said previously that you, you sort of don't fuse genres. Yeah. Um, well, that's I think it's misleading. I said it very early on. I always, I always like to use the phrase synthesis rather than fusion because fusion is bringing two separate things and sticking them together. Synthesis is submerging one with the other and it's a process that has to happen for me internally. So is there a problem with fusion? I would say so, yeah. The complication is there was a musical genre called fusion and actually a lot of those guys like John McLaughlin and Miles and all, they actually were doing a synthesis. That's the complication. So even though the genre was called fusion, they were going at this thing in a very deep way, especially John McLaughlin, things like Shakti and where he was crossing over with Indian classical music and they really went deep beneath the surface of that thing. It wasn't, just a, it wasn't just a fusion. Fusion for me, where I have a problem with it, is in our, our era, in this time. Because too many people go, oh yeah, we put this with that and this with that. Because everything is too, we, you know, globalization, we're all connected now. We're all, so we all think we're connected, just like we all think we're connected virtually. But actually, we don't speak to one another properly. So with all the connection and communication, it all reflects the same thing. People walk down the street with their phones and they cross, they don't look one another in the eye. When I go back to Africa or to Gambia or places like that and you see the communal thing, the music and 
you know, whether it's a festival they're having in, in, in a period and in the whole village where everyone comes together and the, the movement and the percussion and the dance, people come in the circle, go out, come in the circle, go out. That's communication. You were quite, quite quick in your sort of response of like, yeah, no, I don't, I, I don't do that. Um, and that perhaps sort of implies to me that, that, it, that, that fusing of genres, I mean, we've talked about the difference between fusion and fusing of genres, that, that there's something about that that is in some way uh, unpalatable or that it's sort of inevitably unsuccessful. Not unsuccessful, but I think it doesn't go it doesn't go to the to the crooks of the matter. The people that I think were successful at this thing that we are all trying to do in this period, people like Ruchi Sakamoto, I've just seen his documentary, who bridged east to west, so they said. <clears throat> but he was an all-round musician, a person that composes, produces, is an artist, all of those things. It's within him those influences. Then I look at some of my contemporaries like um, Talvin Singh, Nitin Sawney, the same thing. They're drawing from their experiences. These are not things from outside. They're within their experience. So anything that someone does from within their experience is going to work. There's an Irish musician composer called Michal O'Sullivan that I used to work, he's just passed away now. But um, it's a very strong composer with Irish traditional and Western classical influences. But this is his experiences. I have an issue when people try and fuse things that are not within their experience because it's not auth it, there's an authenticity issue. That's, it's just purely that. And I think creating music, composing music, one should always try to be as truthful as possible. Any genre. So it doesn't matter if you're going to have 15 genres. If you happen to be in 15 genres through your experience, then do 15 genres because it will work. But if you're just in one, that's not a problem. But if you want to now embrace another, that's got to be part of your journey. You can't just go, oh yeah, that's nice. Then it will just, that's musically what will happen, that's nice, added to what I do. But if you want to really embrace something, that's why I said it takes time. So I, I guess I sort of wondered whether your sort of earlier description of these sort of different uh, divergent uh, musical influences, whether there's a connection between that and your own sort of perceived sense of racial and ethnic identity. What I shared, what I learned for myself was the importance of defining myself and not allowing others to define me. That led me on the journey of African classical music in terms of my, particularly in terms of the Greer tradition and the Kora. I, will, I didn't like the term world music because I don't know what that means because we're all in the world. I didn't like even traditional music because Western classical music is also traditional music. It's the tradition of Western classical music. So again, you know, that's coming, trying to put it in a different box, ethno, you know, and then before that it was ethnomusicology. And so there's many of these boxes that don't help with an understanding necessarily of where the music is coming from. A lot of them are based on geography, not music. So I wanted something that was clearly for me my understanding of how I come to this music. For me, the Kora is a classical tradition. The way it's passed down from generation to generation over the last 700 years, in terms of the repertoire, in terms of the extemporization, in terms of the strictness of the musical codes, you don't just come and do anyhow. So it has its methodologies which are just as strict, it has its disciplines that are just as harsh, as Western classical music. So for me personally, I never saw any difference. I mean, I saw difference. I didn't see any, I saw them as equal. With the cello, I didn't have to define that because it was already defined and clear for people. But when it was the chorus, like, you know, you, you come with the chorus and they say, oh, I was, in, I was in a holiday in Kenya, which is nice, but it's got nothing to do with me playing the chorus. And these are the reference points, not, what is the tradition? What, they're not musical ones, they're racial ones. And that's where I had the problem. So I was like, okay, well then I'll define it for myself. And whenever I did that, I could see certain people would be upset because it's almost like you've jumped the gun 
and you've already gone, yeah, this is me and this is, this is me and this is my box. But it was important and I passed that on to other artists that I worked with. Like I worked with a, a rapper, spoken word artist later, a guy called HKB Finn, who was working, who came from a hardcore hip hop background from UK. And then we were doing a collaboration in the early noughties. And I said, the main thing you need to be clear on, because he had a very particular cultural thing that we were dealing with. I said, you need to be clear with your definition. And he, he had the term acoustic Afro hip hop. So it was clear. And he even called one of his albums um, acoustic Afro hip hop. So he, in that statement, was defining what he does before someone else starts going, it's the new hop hip or trip bop or whatever they call it, some next thing. You tell them what you're doing, not the other way around. And so he did it, even my sister did it with her Afro, acoustic Afro soul. And we were all coming from that thing of, you tell them what you do before you do it, and then you do it. Because otherwise, black music has had a history of being told what it's doing from outside in. So just to go back to this fusion thing, because I mean, you, as you sort of mentioned, you know, fusion is uh, is often understood as sort of like referring to a specific style of, of jazz, and I, I wondered with your experiences whether the term in your mind is sort of kind of tainted with the associations of fusion as a jazz style, or um, perhaps. Tainted is maybe the wrong word, like intrinsically linked to that jazz. Yeah, I mean, I think I had problems, I even had problems with jazz as a genre, I, not as the music and the players, but I'm saying as a, as a genre, because I remember there was a book came out and I was in it and it was called Jazz. <laughs> and I didn't really feel that I was a jazz player. I was playing with jazz musicians, but I was playing cello and cora. And, and I remember when we first, with my fellow composer, Paul Reed, we, we got together and we started to formulate this thing about being composers and what that means coming from the diaspora and African traditions and Western classical and how you balance all these things. And we were going through all those debates and issues. And when we first presented a concert in 95, which was really us coming out as composers, I remember one journalist or reviewer kind of said, it's like he caught us or he, he kind of presented it like he caught us out because he was like, yeah, this term, I don't know what we'd say, to composers or whatever. And he said, well, actually, it turns out that Paul was the jazz player, you know, jazz pianist from blah, 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 and Tundi from this, you know, played with Orphe and whatever. So it's like trying to put you back in a box. Um, and we'd done this, con we were doing this concert with London's players from the London Sinfonietta and string, new string quartets and all of that. And it was like he, he had an issue not with the music, but it was like he had an issue with us coming out of the box that had been prescribed for us. I never saw jazz or this box. I just went there because the musicians were interesting and the music was interesting. So I'm like, yeah, they're doing some things. They're older than me. They're young musicians doing great music. I'm going to be there. That's why later I started to be more careful about definitions and defining myself. And so that's why I was very particular with things like fusion and all these things, because they were to do with boxes that were being put on us. And I wanted to define myself. And so my term was African classical music. And then these musical forms that have come out of the African diasporic experience, which I was connected to. If you don't define yourself, the definitions end up getting placed on you. And they're always wrong, not being funny. But if we go through the history of black music, I don't think there's a term that's correct still to today, really. Coltrane didn't like the term jazz. I won't go into what jazz originally meant, but it was not a particularly beneficial term for the musicians who came out of an African diasporic experience in America. But when you connect it historically and culturally to its origins, 
and you look at the griot tradition and the links with the blues and the blues with this form they call jazz and then reggae and blues and jazz and soul and this suddenly you see a very powerful narrative to which I'm a part of and I'm connected but when you say jazz I'm not a jazz musician but I'm connected to the story that I just mentioned so that's how I saw it from the beginning but unfortunately it's been rearranged for us our music we never really got on top of our own definitions and this is what I learned pretty early on. One of the people that influenced me with that was uh, Winter Marcellus because when he came over and he was very young at the time he was so clear about what he meant by jazz and what he was doing and I was like wow because someone said okay what's jazz and he went jazz is blue blaze this, 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 and he just had his definition like pow I was like okay I can respect that because you know exactly who you are, what you're doing and where you're coming from. For me, I then went back to my forms of music to get an understanding and African classical music, what is that? Historically, culturally, what is it connected to? All of those things and then out of that, I then looked at myself as a composer. So I wrote my own narrative. I wasn't going to have a narrative thrown at me because my experiences were things, things that were thrown at me didn't make any sense to me.